Hi, this is Doug with H Wood Engineering, and today I'd like to show you how to make your own organic force to fire hand cut Yule log using a big old one man crosscut saw. So let's get to it. So, before we get to cutting, just a bit of background here. I bought this saw from the Crosscut Saw Company out of Seneca Falls, New York. A uh, great company, makes a lot of saws and saw related products. This is a four and a half foot Tuttle Tooth one man crosscut saw, uh, but it is adaptable for two people. You can put this handle on the end here and uh, works pretty well. And I wanted to buy this saw because I, I don't really like using chainsaws for a variety of reasons. I mean, no, I mean, if you like chainsaws, go at it. It's just not my personal preference. So I wanted to, to learn how to do things by hand. And little did I know that this is a, this is a piece of high technology that does require a lot of technique and skill and knowledge. And when I first got the saw, I was like, okay, how do, how do I use this? Like, let me look up some video tutorials um, just as far as form and uh, technique. Um, but I couldn't find anything. What I did find a lot of was crosscut saw competitions. And so I tried to mimic the, the motions and the mechanics of these professionals, these professional sawyers. But what I soon came to realize is that they are optimizing for speed, for sprinting, right? They want to get through one piece of wood as quickly as possible. And that's not necessarily the form and mechanics you want to use if you're spending all day bucking up uh, an entire tree. So it's, it's kind of like a marathon versus a sprint situation, right? Sprinters don't necessarily run the fastest marathons, right? I'm sure they're better than the average person, but you want different kind of mechanics and techniques and such when you are spending all day doing this. So you can use a crosscut saw just out in the woods on, a, on the tree that's fallen down to buck it up. Uh, in this case, I've made my own bucking horse. So please see a link in the description where I go over the construction of this bad boy in more detail. Uh, but just some major details here. Uh, I have it at about my hip height. All right, I'm a little tall, so it's a little little higher than maybe you would you would have it. Uh, I have. One special addition that I made is the stable is the stabilizer. So you can see these rocks just hanging off uh, on a big big limb. I also have these chains down here to keep uh, the whole thing from collapsing if the piece of wood is very heavy. And the whole thing is foldable for easy storage and transportation. Now, because we're not using a chainsaw, which is like magic, and you can just slice up a whole tree and like minutes, uh, this is a lot intense physical labor. So you want to make sure you're not wasting energy. So part of that first step is just to uh, make sure that your logs are exactly the length that you want them to be. So as pr pretty much as big as they can be and still fit into your fireplace or furnace. And for that, I made a good old fashioned knotted string uh, that's marked off. I think this is like a foot and a half and it's this is uh, the length of my fireplace. So when, I, uh, when I'm bucking up a tree, I just kind of stick, you know, tie this on one end of the tree and then just make marks at each knot. Uh, this is the last piece from a gray birch that I cut down last year. And so I'm just gonna be cutting this in half to get two more Yule logs get a bonus log on your last cut. <laughs> now when you have a whole big log in here, it, the weight itself keeps it pretty stable. Um, but as you get down towards the end, if you're trying to cut this, this thing will just wobble around. So to prevent that, I have this rope here that I use to lock down using what I call a torsion knot. So first let's get the log in position. place I cut I want that just past the end of the bucking horse and already you can see that the log is naturally just gonna fall down by itself so let's lock up this torsion knot
All right, so you can see a lot of tension on this rope now. I can hang my full body weight off of this now. So very stable. So now that we got the place where we want to cut, we take a tool called a bark spud. So this is kind of like a, a curved chisel looking thing. Uh, I also bought this from the Crosscut Saw Company, the same place I bought the saw. And how you use this is you just chip a line into the bark. And why are you using this? Well, because the bark is like the armor of the tree and it has a lot of particulate matter. It's, uh, it binds the, the teeth of the saw, just makes the whole process harder and damages the saw more. So. Got all the bark removed and later you can collect all this bark this is a gray birch uh, so the bark is really good for tinder kindling to start fire and now what I like to do uh, is make a little groove for the saw so you, so it's easier to start the cut you'll find that the saw really jumps around uh, without this you don't need it but uh, I take a beater knife so a knife that you don't really care about. I use a K-bar and uh, just a, a, a log. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just chip a groove in here. So uh, this is kind of what it looks like here. Nice little V groove. Now let's start the cut. To start the cut, I'm not using any particular form, just going slow and steady to deepen that V groove. But once the cut is deep enough, that's where we get pretty deep into the techniques. So start taking notes. So in no particular order, uh, one of the things you want to do is make sure that you're getting every tooth of the saw engaged for an equal amount of time. So I push. You want to go all the way to the last tooth on the end here, and then all the way back. All the way forward, all the way back. It's very easy to get in the habit of just going like this. Then another thing, so it's natural to just grab the saw like this, and that's what I did when I first started using the saw, right? Your thumb around here. What I found though is that if you're doing this for a long time, or if you're doing this for a few hours, you're, you'll get this really uncomfortable sore feeling between your thumb and your uh, pointer finger. 
and it's not like a good wholesome like muscle ache feeling it's more just like it's more like uh if i keep doing this i'm gonna get like tendonitis or, or arthritis or something and so i experimented with kind of like a praying mantis like monkey hook kind of hold and at first this feels less stable uh less strong less accurate but uh if you get used to it it does allow you to more comfortably hold uh, use this saw over a longer period of time but again if this is a sprint right if you're in a cross cut saw competition i would go with this grip but we're running a marathon here so let me uh, get this cut a little deeper you can just get a feel for the motion that i'm doing here I encourage you to go check out some crosscut saw competition videos. I put some links in the description for your convenience, but hopefully you'll see the difference. So when you when you're optimizing for speed, it's a lot more arm action. So you just see these guys just like this back and forth, and they're big burly guys, and uh, you know they're using their hips a little bit, but it's a lot of shoulder and arm action which you need to do if you're going if you want to go really fast hopefully you'll notice that i'm using my body more so i'm trying to sway back and forth like this and try to really torque and try to torque your hips too so you can kind of break this down like yoga poses so when you're like all the way towards the end this is kind of like a warrior one where you're, ideally your hips are square to the log and then for the pullback, you will, ideally you want your hips, um, you know, 90 degree turn perpendicular. Um, you're not. That's pretty hard to do. It. You need pretty flexible hips to like truly go 90 degrees. I probably get like a 45 degree rotation, something like that. But just something to keep in mind when you push. You want this butt up clenched. And then when you pull back, you want this butt clenched. And another body mechanic thing. So uh, if you think about it like this, when you go like this, this is the strongest, most stable position that your hands can be in. So if like, if you came up to me and tried to move my hands, this is the position I would want my hands in. It, like if my hands are out here, any other position, it's easier to manipulate, to move my hands. So right in here is where you want your hands the most amount of time because that means you're using your your arm muscles the most efficiently so another efficiency thing when you're here and you want to pull the saw back i like to let my arms go as slack as possible and kind of use them just like ropes like you're pulling on a rope so imagine you're you just have a rope attached 
to your shoulder here, and you're just dragging it back with your body instead of using your uh, wrists and your biceps, and in which case you're lo losing valuable energy. You also want to let gravity do the work as much as possible both ways. So you want to tilt the saw back when you're pulling it back. I'm exaggerating here a little bit. And then come down on it on the push stroke. Breath is also very important, as with all things in life. So I personally just blow out when I'm pushing. So And breathe in on the pullback. So yeah, major things I'm focusing on. Breath first, always. That's like the bit, that's the foundation. Then uh, focusing on your your butt muscle clenching <laughs> for the for the hip twist. As you get deeper into the cut as well, you'll find the saw might start binding on you, especially depending on the type of wood. If there's like a lot of sap, if it's it's still a very green piece of wood. Uh, so one thing that can help with that is a solvent. I personally use. Uh, dissolve it. So I'll just give a few spritzes on both sides of the saw. Yeah, and that'll make the job a little easier. All right, so let's cut down to the halfway point, at which points I'll, I'll change sides.
All right, we're about halfway through, so it's time to change sides. So go to your, let's say, weaker hand, right? This is like if you're going to a gym, you wouldn't just do bicep curls with a one arm and then call it a day. Uh, so similarly, if you were just using one side all day, you'd be a twisted mess by the end of the day. So let's give the saw another spritz just to make it easier. And let's finish this puppy off. tree were just a little bit thicker at this point I would be driving wedges into the crack here and you'll see this you'll see people do this in competition it'll, it'll be two people one person on the saw and then a, uh, an assistant that once the saw gets deep enough they tap a wedge in so this is obviously to help the saw go in smoother to prevent it binding but not an option here because if I put the wedge in due to the rocking motion of the saw, it would just pop it right back out.
Actually, now that I'm near the base of the tree, it actually is thick enough to get a wedge in there, so. Let's just make my job a little easier towards the end. what we're left with this thing will get a uh, nice yule log this will give you about this will give you about eight hour burn in the fireplace believe it or not all right it's a little shorter than i usually cut them just for for the video uh the full length log that i cut it, I, my record is 12 hours in the fireplace uh this is with gray birch very solid tight grain it has like oils and sap that like keep the flame going. So I still have a lot to learn about the crosscut saw. I have a lot to improve on. Uh, you may have noticed that on on my pullback, the saw was kind of was vibrating a little bit. Yeah, I'm not sure how to mitigate that in the best way. Um, you'll also see the cut goes through a little diagonal, despite my best efforts to keep it perfectly straight through the log which is bad for two reasons one you're cutting a little bit into the grain which is less efficient it's more efficient to go completely perpendicular uh, you can test this yourself try to try to saw into any piece of wood uh, along the grain and it's harder to do uh, and then the second reason of course is that you're it's a longer distance to cut uh, again, I don't know what I'm doing wrong exactly, so I'm still experimenting with that. And then we come to the saw itself. Like I said, high piece of technology. I, I thought, okay, it's just a saw and you use it. Well, this thing requires a lot of tuning and maintenance and sharpening, uh, dependent on the type of wood as well, and requires a lot of extra tools to achieve that. Uh, you can find the link in the description. There's like a five hour YouTube series just on sharpening and maintaining and fine tuning these things. So I still haven't gotten into that too much. So this saw is pretty dull. <laughs> now this is just, you know, my first year and a half using it. I don't mind. And in fact, I want the saw to be dull. Can you imagine that? Now, why is that? Well, with a dull saw, it forces you to perfect your technique. So if this saw was super sharpened and fine-tuned to this particular wood, it would allow me to be a little more sloppy in my mechanics, in my technique. And I wouldn't necessarily be teaching my body the most efficient way to saw. Whereas if my body gets used to a dull saw, all of us, and perfects the mechanics, all of a sudden when I go to a sharper saw, I'm just going to be a machine. So yeah, I'll, I'll revisit this this whole sawing demo perhaps in another year or two or ten when I when I learn how to really properly sharpen and tune these things. But until then, I hope this video was helpful. I, if you don't have your own crosscut saw, I hope you go out and buy one. There, you can find them in uh, old thrift stores and antique stores. So um, yeah, as I said, this is a high piece of technology, and I'm I'm glad I'm learning how to use it. Uh, very rewarding to cut your own logs and then burn them on a fire. So please like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.